May 20th. It says 7 p.m., but believe me, it didn't start till about quarter to eight. So tonight we're going to continue. With, we'll start out with uh, Bart Plantanga, Plantanga, through Jill Rappaport, and the last speaker tonight will be Peter Lamborn Wilson. You may hear some references during the show to uh, people like Rollo Whitehead and Yoko something or other, and believe me, I was real confused when I hear this, thinking that these may be mysterious people in the beatnik movement that I'd never heard of, but it turns out it's just an inside joke by the people who were running this thing and their mythical characters, et cetera, et cetera, so sit back and enjoy the show, and here's Jim. Well, we're going to have Bart Plantanga is going to talk a little more about that. Uh, how many of you read the Weekly World News? Oh, everybody. Uh, uh, but how many of you are aware that they've been covering the beatniks for a long, long time? Uh, what's that? They've, they've, they've run a bunch of stories about the beatniks, and as recent as 1993, but this one comes from 1991, May of 1991. Beatnik Baby is modeled for movie monsters. <laughs> Hollywood director David Cronenberg claims his monsters for the movie Naked Lunch were modeled after the real-life elephant man love child of shock beatnik author William Burroughs and wife Joan Volman. <laughs> Quote, I didn't want to believe it and didn't until I heard him or it speak, Cronenberg admits, in that famous pinched burrow's twang from its own leather, leathery gills. <laughs> this horrifying human oddity was apparently conceived in a Mexican heroin hacienda during a drug shooting binge in 1951. The lizard-skinned love child named Jimbo has until now been kept out of the public eye at the request of Burroughs. Cronenberg claims he was introduced to Jimbo after a jilted adolescent Moroccan lover of Burroughs first approached Weekly World News with information leading to his discovery on a Tijuana Mezcal cactus farm owned by Burroughs and another beatnik and Buddhist and budget advisor, Gary Snyder. Cronenberg claims he was shocked to see an actual breathing elephant man who looked like the embodiment of his own special effects dreams. It was like I was standing face to snout with the very nightmare that's dogged me for all these years. I've been thinking of making Naked Lunch into a film. Cronenberg says that all photos he took during his encounter have since been de destroyed to protect the fragile sanity of this crazy result of a science experiment gone bad in the womb. And Cronenberg insists he'll sue those in the Just Say No Foundation, a heritage foundation sponsored anti-drug group who persist in spreading vicious rumors that he proposed Jimbo be used as an example, a freak result of the horrors of drug addiction. They are viciously wrong. I'm not in the business of promoting freak shows. This, this just appeared this month in the Weekly World News, and it's called Filth is Art to Wannabeats. <laughs> a recent survey of 1,500 self-declared wannabeats by Professor Lehman Potts, director of the Center of Jazz Poetry at Milford Community College in Milford, Pennsylvania, reveals that these, quote, post-beat posers are beating more than just their bongos. <laughs> they are beating down the doors of Madison Avenue while beating down their own beating their own chests louder than any ever thought possible. As they continue their tradition of sacrilegious tweaking of norms, we at Weekly World News hear this as the mere drums of conformity or in the words of Professor Potts, quote, the infantile attention getting akin to the child's need to fling feces at his mom, unquote. <laughs> Professor Potts posed a number of hypothetical situations for our sample of 1,500 wannabes. Using one of the demigods of beatdom, William Sewer Burroughs, a penman of many unreadable and obscene so-called novels, including the recent immoral box office bomb, Naked Lunch. If William Burroughs were to urinate in his BVDs, 62% of our sample of wannabes 
claimed they'd be able to divine the future from reading the resultant urine stains the way seers can read the future in tea leaves or the stars. 70% say if these BVDs were hung in an art gallery, they'd have, quote, no problem, unquote, calling it art. 47% would consider any latent scent pleasing to the nose. 24% would go further and declare the scent arousing. 28% would have no qualms about receiving a dream pillow stuffed with the urine-stained BVDs of Burroughs. 52% would pay upwards of $20 to witness the act of BVD despoilation and would have no trouble calling it performance art. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, got, I have one more, but um, this one's called Computer Virus Infects Best Sellers. And this is about Rolla Whitehead, which is why he's so important to us. <laughs> Best sellers are falling victim to a strange computer virus that mysteriously injects fragments of nonsensical and perverse poetry into the computer files of bestseller manuscripts. And soon, quote, no book will be safe from this dastardly infection, unquote, or so claims the proud carrier and self-professed connoisseur of dormant diseases, Rollo Whitehead. Whitehead, now 65 years old, has for years been investigating dormant diseases like feline leukemia, diseases that hitch rides on the infected being's DNA for generations, even centuries, and then suddenly become activated at certain instants in history, usually during some severe moment of world anxiety, such as World War II. 35 years ago, Rolla Whitehead was anything but a medical researcher. He was known back then as the shepherd of a ragtag flock of would-be bards called the Beatniks. But early on, he distanced himself from these wannabes as he's fond of calling them by, quote, refusing to participate in their ego shenanigans and media brokering as they desperately sought the approval of the very normals they publicly denounced, unquote. As Whitehead explains during our exclusive phone conversation with him, Whitehead went so far as to refuse to publish his poems and then irked the rest, of, rest by refusing to even write them down. This he did after having had his apartment ransacked back in the free love 60s by those, quote, seeking remunerative, remunerative inspiration, unquote, in his cluttered Greenwich Village garrets. These stolen manuscripts later reappeared mysteriously as the beatnik classics On the Road by Jack John Kerouac and Howl by Allen Ginsberg. Since then, he has committed any and everything to the, quote, safe deposit box of my memory, unquote. Safe until now, with the advent of personal computers came a whole new world of record keeping and information processing. With it also came the, quote, barnacles clinging to the ship of inspiration, unquote, the various hackers and software scofflaws who took Rollo Whitehead as their mentor when some of Whitehead's poems and fragments in 1980 found their way <clears throat> into the reissue files of pocketbook publishing. How this happened is still a mystery, and if Whitehead has a clue, he isn't talking. No one, including experts in computer virology, are sure whether it was via telephone modem, performed by a prankster, editorial error, or via computer virus. The lines, quote, brilliant, swerving, flecks of steam, hissing low like satyrs, come in smally, lift in silky, blow a ham bone, unquote, appear, <laughs> appeared as if by miracle <clears throat> in amongst the pages of the pocket Aristotle, like, <laughs> like leaf flight on a rose bush, as Whitehead muses. The second incident occurred a year later when some more of Whitehead's self-described quote, post-nonsensical verse infections found their way into the worldwide bestseller, The Rockefellers, an American Dynasty. <laughs> he is flattered and amused, but really doesn't find it all that strange. Viruses of all kinds are very wily, adaptable buggers, he said. Other authors victimized by Whitehead's mysterious verse infections 
are Barbara Cartland, Donald Trump, Nancy Reagan, and Stephen King. Although in the case of King, no one really noticed until four years after The Shining was first published. Whitehead insists there is no secret, it merely happens like weather, like a bowel movement. These events, these seeming miraculous infections, sent shockwaves to the entire publishing industry. It left editors, typesetters, and proofreaders alike shell-shocked and miffed. Whitehead's infections have led to a ver led to various national information industry legislation, the tightening of entrance codes, the rethinking of security systems for the nation's entire information and intelligence community. And along with that, the ad advent of an entire new industry, software doctors, security technology, and computer antivirus specialists. The way I look at it, Whitehead says, I'm the best thing that ever happened to some of these books and certainly the best stimulus to come along in the software, indu software industry in a long, long time. Thank you. Naked Lunch was imagined by William Burroughs in its entirely, entirety while he was sitting in a dentist chair having root canal. <laughs> so, here to explain more about that is Phil Rappaport. wife because her head was bigger than the apple he was aiming for in a late century rerouting of ancient masculine instinct the destruction of the mother goddess and the reformation of the patrilineal which in turn enhanced an already inescapable putrefaction the decay of homo, homo sapiens she was boring faceless like the female fetuses with which the biblically obsessed component of Aryan nation has begun doing business the better to guilt trip the young and pregnant she couldn't stand up to him 
Humanity is united in its hatred of wives and mothers. Women have to answer in manly terms or get trashed in shooting accidents like the William Tell Overture. It is explained in language like this. Of course, Burroughs hates women. Got news for you, Dad. All men do. Burroughs has been panned by Americans as a dame-hating homo, which neatly lets straights off the hook of the entrenched misogyny with a pit bull bite on the balls of dominant culture as it is now constructed, a wretched little phenomenon located somewhere behind the compost heap of sugarcane creationism, and worse, unless, of course, you get something out of it, and some of us do. Tell you something else. AIDS in Zaire is boring. Famous people are boring. Murder is boring. Nobody can take it anymore. What is it to me who loved Ginsburg or bone jumped him or why? It bores me. I'd shoot him easy. Yes, I think I would in a game of William Tell. Shoot everybody else that bores or scares me too. Redneck, Euro-derived crackers in small Alabama towns and cradle of humanity-derived brats with gold teeth dreaming of bashing in my white skull on the train to Coney Island. Guns are boring except when they're not. Women dream of guns and it is this which separates them from the mythical depictions of themselves divided, unable to fire, domestic right down to the black rings around the burners. Men are the enemy, and anybody who says they are not is paid off, stupid, or has a death wish. But you could, <laughs> ideally, get along with a man. Women, on the other hand, like any other oppressed group, are annoying. They're a bore. Yeah, I'm one. What of it? Ida shot her, too. Hey, I used to hate old people till I got old. Now I hate the young. <laughs> I hate the chairman of the Board of Union Carbide, Ronald Reagan, and the Pope, but I hate anybody beating down the gates of white privilege, too, since I hate giving up any of the meager goodies I got. The family and the church and gay guys not inviting me into their dick bars, not seeing me when I move tall between them and the objects of their testy, heavy lust. I hate all of them. <laughs> I think it was Natalie Wood who said, now I, too, have hate. I enjoyed the first two paragraphs of Naked Lunch, which is about all I've had time for. He hates women, he is the enemy, but he hates men too. Anyway, he's only one guy, skinny and old. The greater, the greater part of the world doesn't give a shit. Misanthropy pales beside misogyny. Its inclusivity excludes exclusivity. I think it was Mercedes McCambridge who said that. And good books are bad, yeah, I'd shoot him too, claiming it was a game, which in this case wouldn't be lying. Hatred is an under-examined and over-mystified force which makes for some pretty bad structures. Like Lao Kun on some militarily vast scale, you consume whole what won't have you and it turns your insides black. William Burroughs shot the bitch because he was the bitch. He aborted her, which is no more nor less than that which all men have always wanted to do to all women, just as women have always wanted to do it to them. He fired first before she was ready to fire on him, that's it. Nobody could have prevented it. It was an act that in the absence of that sentimental scandal known as Judeo-Christian morality could be seen as the culmination of the decree of an oracle or the random movement of molecules in space without cause or effect. What are guns for if not shooting? The real crime is interpretation. William Burroughs had said that the shooting, w has said that the shooting was an accident. Who is anyone to deny or second guess such drooling baloney? What happens, happens. If women would get out of the way, they'd get shot less often. If they'd, if they'd stop unilaterally holding up the battered body of civilization, maybe we could get on with the business of recovering our savage origins and start over again at year zero where nobody carries weight and everybody lives in harmony, killing their attackers firsthand. He was tired of her cooking breakfast for him, tired of putting his arm around her in that tired old patri patriarchal manner. He was tired of being a man, and if she had been equally tired, it would have been him lying on the floor and her writing the books and making appearances. <laughs> Divorce, drugs, and disengagement were, for the white goddess, the three wild and mop-headed sisters of the lexical wood endowed by Dionysios at that magic crossroads of splendor and mortality where the human project peaked and started upon its downward journey. William Burroughs had a son, William Burroughs Jr. The son wrote a book and died. One son, one son's book was enough. Having fathered that, the idea of wife was no longer more vibrant than the idea of yesterday's hypodermic needle, yesterday's burnt toast, or yesterday's holy underwear. William Burroughs fired the wife. Enough was enough. And now William Burroughs, husband and father, was laid to rest. Every man needs to be penetrated, and every woman needs a wife, a gun, and the balls to shoot them both. In, in this modern land, fatigue is death, which is why you don't want anybody getting tired of you, because the only weapon against fatigue is a gun. If we as a nation could get tired together and pull triggers together, everything would certainly be all right, like I care one way or the other. <laughs> Okay, that
that in that same year, 1959, uh, the Beatitude magazine was founded for uh, the many beat hobbyists that were beginning to uh, come to the surface. And to uh, say more about that is Peter Lambert Wilson. Nobody told me this was going to be an evening devoted to irony. So uh, they uh, they tricked me. I wrote I wrote something quite serious about the crimes of the beats, the crimes of the beats, and uh, silly Oriental religions. <laughs> Remember beat Zen? The idea, as I recall it, was to eliminate all pea-brained pious orthodoxy and ethnic exclusiveness from Zen, retaining only its taste of suddenness, insightfulness mental freedom and attentiveness, rowdy humor and dada spirituality. This taste, it was believed, might prove compatible with natural but repressed new world tendencies toward nature worship, anarchism, or at least disrespect for pompous authority, and a kind of folk surrealism that pervades our good old collective narrative, a quality known at the time as holy goofiness. Now, as it turned out, according to the principle Zen mind, beginner's mind, this naive, native, fresh-minted version of an ancient teaching proved to be quite brilliant. This impure and foolish misunderstanding on the part of a few ill-informed barbarians was actually the moment of the transmission of the Dharma and the very salvation of a moribund faith. By dumping centuries of rotten accretions of monkish pride, upper-class violence, moralism, reaction, and bad consciousness, the unwitting beats had carried out the one and only operation capable of making Buddhism or any other ancient or oriental tradition useful to us here and now. They made it new by radically re-envisioning it and even reinventing it on the basis of a couple of paperback translations and a series of sudden insights probably fueled more by marijuana than meditation. I wanted to be funny about this, but actually what happened next simply makes one sad. A host of tired old Europeans and Asians, attracted by the spiritual energy of America in the 1950s and 60s, told us that our clever inventions, beat Zen, etc., proved our native talent, but that we should forget about it all now and buy the real thing, orthodox mystical tradition, instead. From them, of course. Because to go herring off into the world of the spirit with no master was dangerous and heretical. We were bound to come to grief if we kept it up. Instead, we should strive to become old and tired like them <laughs> through much self-repression, self-delusion, and self-debasement. They called it spiritual discipline, meditation, prayer, and tradition. We Americans are painfully self-conscious about our lack of background. Some of us react by becoming narrow-minded, bigoted, patriotic believers while others are all too prone to fall for any form of authority provided it's exotic or certifiably ancient. So we signed up in the armies of Orthodox, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever. The Dumbos got taken for rides by various Maharishis and fat kids from India, <laughs> while the smart ones held out for authentic tired old bourgeois. Years later, it turned out that many of the European and Asian masters and their New World imitators were in the game for money, or sex, or power. For them, naturally, not for their disciples. And enlightenment wasn't all it was cracked up to be either. It didn't even improve the personality, much less cure AIDS. Enlightened people turned out to be just as vulnerable to being human as the next poor slob. Or worse, they sometimes came to believe their enlightenment freed them from any obligation to act decently toward their spiritual inferiors. So if the Beats committed any crime in their discovery of the exotic Orient, the fault lay in their own distrust of themselves. Like all revolutionaries, they failed to go far enough in the logical ramifications of their own actions. 
by inventing beat Zen, they had, right at the beginning, attained enlightenment. What needed to be carried out afterwards was the far more difficult task of constructing an entire new culture on the basis of that initial flash of the spirit. Instead, all we have are a few remnants of a forgotten moment of genuine brilliance, while the beats themselves mostly either died young or converted to some orthodoxy or another. It's not too late, or so I feel. We've had 20 or 30 years of the guru princip and seen that it doesn't work either. But some of us are still alive and still capable of thought, albeit less cloudless thought than in 1959. <laughs> I suggest we carry on as we started and finish the looting and pillaging of the great old traditions and the imaginal creation of our own tailor-made heresies or even new revelations. I suggest we go back to the moment when we were stupid enough to believe in our own creative spirit. Back to beat Zen. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, we enjoyed being there and uh, taping it, and uh, it was really like it was really like a party, a party in your pants. No, a party in your living room. Uh, we'll be back again next week with more of the show. And uh, in the time left, uh, I want you folks to remember that this is nothing new, and it's continuing now. It has different names. It was a Greenwich Village in the 20s. It was called Bohemianism. And bohemianism, I think, can be traced back, if you like. The term itself goes back to the um, University of Paris, the Sorbonne, in the 14th century. I don't know which century. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, the most rowdy students, and they were all rowdy, but the rowdiest of the rowdy came from uh, the Czech lands, from Bohemia. And that term stuck, and... Um, when the patronage dropped out, as, uh, when, when the feudal society broke up, when patronage dropped out and the poor bourgeois artists, artists in the bourgeois society had to fend for themselves. In the 1814s, you had Henri Merger, who wrote La Vie de Bohème, which became the wonderful opera, the only opera I've ever seen, La Bohème. He earned his money, guess what, doing during the day. His day job, he never quit, well, he did after a while. He was a fucking advertising man writing uh, for, a, uh, for a trade journal of the millinery trade. Uh, Paris was the world center of the millinery trade. And uh, once he got his big hit, he quit and uh, started writing full time, but um, maybe he should have kept his day job. And this kind of travail has been going on unto this very day. Very few of you know it, but uh, I used to have a day job, too. But uh, today, uh, I'm a retired humorist. So, um, tune in next week for some more fun and cookies. No cookies, because that has sugar. Um, uh, more fun and sex. See you then. Oh, Jesus, are we still on camera? Oh, I, I have a fly on my nose.